Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Vincent Humphrey with the Default Task Force. I'd like to welcome you all to the first of a series of webinar installments uh, coming from the Task Force. Uh, we have a wonderful program for you today. We are honored and, and proud to have HUD with us today to give us FHA um, and lending updates that I know that you are bubbling with anticipation to receive. Um, with us today is Ms. Esther Yamashiro and Mr. Frederick Griefer with HUD. So we want to extend a warm welcome to the both of them and say thank you for uh, extending their time and talents to educate us today on what's going on in the world of HUD. Uh, moderating, our panel, moderating our panel today is Ms. Caroline Gim. Um, we, she is part of the task force. So this again is one of a series of webinars that we'll be launching throughout the year. Um, we are evolving this platform as we mentioned earlier in uh, other calls from just a pure REO default distressed um, platform we will include economic updates, legal environment updates, uh, regulatory agency updates, best practices, um, asset management roundtables, networking and marketing, and business opportunities and creating partnerships. So many tentacles coming out of this area that we think the membership and beyond can take advantage of and really, really get involved with. And starting today, we're gonna kick off a strong series of webinar events. We hope that you uh, listen intently and ask questions if you have them um, and really get involved with the task force in 2021. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton over to Caroline and kick off our session today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vince. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on myself, but my name is Caroline Gim and I'm a real estate broker and a proud member of the ARIA default task force. Um, with today, we've got some fantastic speakers and let me introduce them. Uh, Frederick Griefer currently serves as the Deputy Director of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the uh, Santa Ana Home Ownership Center, which oversees uh, the Western states and several of the outlying Pacific territories. Uh, after, graduate, after finishing grad school in California, Fred moved to Washington, D.C. to work in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, working on grants policy. Uh, he worked at the EPA as a team leader for recipient oversight before moving over to HUD, where he served as Director of Grants Management and Director of Field Operations uh, for the Office of Native American Programs. And in 2019, he and his family decided to move back to California to serve as the Deputy Director at the Santa Ana Home Ownership Center. Uh, also joining us is Esther Yamashiro. Esther joined the Santa Ana Home Ownership Center in 2008 as an underwriter. Uh, she served as a branch chief in the Processing and Underwriting Division since 2012 where she led the lender training team. She's also worked on several initiatives developing policy and processes during this time. She brings her experience in single family policies and programs to her current position as the housing program officer for the Santa Ana Home Ownership Center with a focus on education and outreach. Uh, prior to joining the Santa Ana Hawks, Esther spent 20 plus years in the private sector uh, doing mortgage loan origination, underwriting and funding. So welcome to our speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'm going to just uh, let Frederick take over and let us uh, give us a bit of an update on what's going on with HUD. Fred? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, before I uh, get started, um, I want to first thank you and Vince, um, as well as um, the rest of the leadership at the Asian Real Estate Association of America. Um, for inviting um, the Santa Ana Home Ownership Center to speak with you all today. Um, when I was researching your organization, one of the things that I was really impressed by um, was that your mission is dedicated to pr promoting sustainable home ownership opportunities in Asian American communities, but it's how, you, how you're planning on doing it, by creating a powerful national voice for housing and real estate professionals that serve this dynamic market. Um, I think it's it, advocacy is extremely important and when I was um, when I was looking at uh, all of your a lot of your accomplishments on your website and researching your history, uh, it was just it, it was extremely impressive to me. And one of our responsibilities is promoting FHA, um, but it's also um, it's in addition to 
it being part of our job. It's a passion of myself as well as Esther. Um, providing you with training and other useful information that you need so that you can advocate for those you represent is something that's very important for us. Um, the work that you've been doing since your founding in 2003 has been phenomenal. Uh, from your outreach to the Census Bureau, advocacy for a preferred language field uh, on the uniform residential loan application, and changing um, underwriting standards to more fairly account for student loans that were in deferment um, while calculating a borrower's debt to income ratio is uh, an accomplishment that you guys should be very proud of. Um, I also admire that you haven't been resting on your laurels, um, but you've laid out a three-point plan that you had for uh, 2020 when it came to ensuring continued access and commitment to affordable lending um, for minority home buyers in uh, government-sponsored enterprises, um, reforming credit score models to increase access to credit for clean, thin credit individuals, as well as promoting greater understanding on the needs of buyers with limited English proficiency. Um, again, I, I, I'm impressed the, the fact that with the changing dynamic market, as you reference in your mission statement, um, you aren't content with resting on your laurels and your previous accomplishments that are, but are forging a path ahead, a vision. Um, and that's a vision that, that we share. Um, it's, it's very important um, uh, for us to work on, on building relationships. I, I As Caroline mentioned, I grew up in California. Uh, however, spending the previous 14 years in DC, I've seen how difficult it is to channel what you are passionate about into a cohesive and effective adv advocacy strategy. But it's clear um, from your accomplishments that you guys have been getting results. Um, since coming to the Santa Ana Home Ownership Center as the deputy director in 2019, it's been one of my goals to build relationships with organizations such as yours, not for a single presentation, but to develop and cultivate long lasting um, relationships based on trust, transparency, honesty, and candor. Uh, when we can do better, please let us know. As part of developing this relationship, it's also my understanding that you guys are planning on having a national convention in, uh, in San Francisco later this year. If you deem it appropriate, um, we would be humbled to have a significant presence at the event, if at all possible, in the hopes we are able to continue to build this relationship. Um, thank you again for the invitation um, and the privilege of being able to speak to you today, address any questions that, that you have. Um, at this time, I would like to turn things over to um, Esther Yamashiro, who was the first person that I had the privilege to hire in my current position. Um, as our housing program officer, Esther is responsible for overseeing our outreach efforts. And I encourage you to reach out to her as our primary point of contact, but also include myself um, as well on any questions that you might have. Um, as Caroline indicated, prior to serving in her current capacity, she served as a branch chief in our processing and underwriting division and has over 35 years of experience in the housing industry, including 12 years at HUD. Um, at this time, I think there might, might be a few questions that, um, that, you, that you have for us. I plan to stay on um, for the entire um, entire time, um, but I'll um, turn things over to Esther at this time. However, if there's certain questions uh, that you have at this time, um, I would I would be happy to answer them. Uh, again, Caroline, Vince, and Aria, thank you so much uh, for the the opportunity. And I think this is the beginning or a continuation of a beautiful uh, relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, so let, give me a moment to share my screen. Um, here we go. Share <laughs> from the beginning. So um, can you all see my screen now? Caroline, just nod. <laughs> Yes, we can. No, yes, we can. I can, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Fred, Caroline, Vincent, Carrie. Um, again, um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I am the housing program officer, and I want to thank Fred for hiring me for the position. I've really enjoyed it. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about FHA. Um, I don't know what 
everybody's um, background is, if it's never heard of FHA to I've been doing FHA forever. Um, so I'm going to kind of start at the beginning so that everybody um, has a little bit of knowledge and can build on that knowledge um, and maybe give you some information you find helpful that you didn't know before. So let's get started. So a little bit of background on FHA single family. Um, what is FHA? Um, so FHA is the Federal Housing Administration and we've actually been around since 1934. FHA literally predates HUD. We were absorbed into the department in um, the 1960s. Um, and, and we've helped millions of families become homeowners. In 1934, when FHA was created, we were a nation of renters. Only one in uh, four in 10 families owned their own home at that time. Um, so why would you use FHA? We have flexible qualifying. It's a lower minimum FICO requirement. We only require three and a half percent down payment. And all of that down payment can come from a gift. Um, we also allow um, all the closing costs and prepaids to be from, from a gift. Uh, so that is a big advantage for our borrowers. Um, the other thing to think about is, is that FHA loans are fully assumable. So think about those buyers you have right now who are closing mortgages in the 2% range and 10 years from now when they're trying to sell that property, what that 2%, 2.5% mortgage means to a potential buyer down the road. So um, that is a great advantage to FHA. So single family, we do residential, one to four units. So single family dwellings, condominiums, two to four unit housing. We do manufactured housing. Um, our primary focus, of course, is owner occupied principal residences. We do do second homes. Uh, those loans have to be reviewed by the Home Ownership Center. They have to meet certain criteria in order to be um, eligible for FHA insured financing. We also do non-owner occupied. Um, those are to government entity and nonprofit borrowers. So you may run across that. You might find it odd, but it is an opportunity that's out there. So our single family programs, um, forward mortgages, we, we of course have purchased and refinances. Um, and our property improvement um, portfolio is, is really excellent if you deal with those properties that need a little bit more love than others. Um, we have a repair rehabilitation program, 203K. You all might be familiar with that. We also have an energy efficient mortgage. Um, and we also have a weatherization um, program uh, for minor repairs um, that can be done post-closing. We also have a disaster loan. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on that later, um, but it's an excellent um, opportunity for, for folks. Um, we also have our home equity conversion mortgage for seniors, um, 62 and older, in order to access the equity in their homes. Um, you know, a lot of seniors are, they, they have this home that they've worked their whole lives and they own this asset, but they can't access the, the equity in it. Well, the home equity can, HECM loan is, in a, is an opportunity for them to be able to access that equity and stay in their homes. Um, we also have a Title I program. It's an equity program. This program is not administered out of the Home Ownership Center, but I just wanted to let you know that it is out there. Um, it's handled by our an office in Albany, um, but it does fall under single family. Um, so for mortgage purchases, as I said before, the minimum down payment is three and a half percent. You can get a gift for down pay, all the down payment, closing costs and prepaids and the lower FICO requirements. So you can get three and a half percent to 580 and 10% uh, down 500 to 579. Now you 
you may bemoan the fact that you can't find a lender that will go down that, that low, but we have seen them and they are out there. Um, we also allow secondary financing, um, government entities, down payment assistance program. We also allow those programs um, with our, in conjunction with our purchase loans. Um, refinance, if, if your clients come to you and say, you know, I wanna refinance my house. Can you, can you give me an idea what to do? So FHA has a rate and term. 97.75% simple refinance. It's for uh, F existing FHA loans only. Um, we do cash out to 80%. And we also have a streamline program. It's for F existing FHA loans. They can go non-credit qualifying. They also have a credit qualifying program, but it's a streamline documentation. The biggest part is they don't have to shell out for an appraisal. So that's a, a, a big cost savings for the borrower. So that's our little refinance portfolio. Um, Ford mortgages for um, property improvement, again, 203K. There's two types of 203K programs. And it, 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 it has to do with type of repairs you're going to do and the amount of repairs you're going to do. So, um, you know, if Again, they, your bars, your um, not borrowers, your clients, your buyers, they can purchase a home using these these programs. They can also refinance using these programs. So, again, a two or three k may be perfect for those properties that you come across that need a little extra love, um, uh, and it's a great program. Uh, our energy efficient um, program. You know, energy efficiency is, is, is a big deal. Um, and it, it, it can, it's a part of the industry that's going to keep uh, growing, I think, um, as, as time goes by. Um, so we have a, a program specifically designed so that the borrowers can make these improvements um, to their home. Uh, weatherization, again, minor repairs completed within 30 days of closing. So this is a disaster loan. Now, nobody wants to think about disaster loans, but they are an unfortunate, unfortunate, unfortunate fact of life. Um, so they must be in a presidentially declared major disaster area, okay? Um, the residences must be destroyed or require reconstruction. So, um, you know, for us out in California, it's the fires. Um, there have been several areas that have been uh, de been declared uh, presidentially declared major disaster areas. Um, so those folks who have lost their homes, they can apply for this disaster loan. They can rebuild where their property was destroyed, or they can relocate anywhere in the U.S. and and be able to utilize this financing to get their new home. They're eligible for 100% financing. There are, of course, qualifying flexibilities because let's face it, these folks have lost everything in the fire. Um, they were not required to have an FHA mortgage on the, house, the home they lost. And that means a renter who lost their home in this disaster can take advantage of this loan to, per to purchase a property, okay? Now, they have to apply within one year of the declaration of the disaster, but, you know, depending on its size and, and the, the speed of recovery, that date may um, be extended. Um, that, that's a case-by-case -case consideration. But um, it is a great program for unfortunate times. So keep that in mind. I hope none of you ever have to make use of it, but just know that it is available and it is a program that we offer. It's a, it's a great opportunity for the people who need it. Uh, so just a little bit on home equity conversion mortgages. Uh, the bars must be 62. 
They must occupy the property as their primary residence and they have to complete counseling. So those are the major highlights as far as home equity conversion mortgages are concerned. So let's move on to, to the stuff you really want. It's the policy updates. So um, some of these are our COVID response. Um, if they are temporary in nature, they're not in, incorporated into the handbook 4000.1, um, but we'll go, there's a definite line in this presentation of which policies are temporary and which are permanent. So let's dive in. So 202004, that is the foreclosure and eviction moratorium. Now, it was published almost a year ago um, and it's been extended several times, but just last week we extended it in, in mortgagee letter 202105 through June 30th. Um, and that mortgagee letter contains a lot of the um, loss mitigation um, programs that are available to the borrower um, once this moratorium is lifted. So um, I encourage you to um, review that mortgagee letter, um, but it has been extended to June 30th, 2021. And that is the application date for a, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so that is the foreclosure and eviction moratorium. It is extended to June 30th. So for those of you who have borrowers who are, uh, or buyers who are trying to qualify for loans, um, this is for verifications of employment and exterior only appraisals. Um, and I need to um, correct this because it was just announced today, this morning, that this guidance has also been extended to June 30th. Um, and I apologize for not being able to update the um, slides, but this was, uh, again, just updated this morning and extended to June 30th. Uh, this is the forbearance. Um, this is for mortgages that are closed and before they can be insured, the borrower ran into trouble. Now, normally um, for a, uh, a mortgage to be eligible for FHA insurance, it has to be current at the time of closing and all payments have to have been made by the borrower. But, you know, these are uncertain times. They're very turbulent times and the borrower may have run into a problem, but the, the lender can still get um, their loan endorsed. Um, and this is effective through March 31st. So this is temporary guidance for uh, those buyers who are self-employed, have rental income, or have a 203K. Um, again, this expiration date was again extended this morning to through June 30th, 2021. Um, so this will help your self-employed borrowers and your, or buyers, I'm sorry, buyers. <laughs> self-employed and rental income, and if they wanna get a 203K loan. So this guidance is for their benefit. Okay. So those are some temporary changes. Um, I'm gonna go through some permanent policy changes. Um, FHA Catalyst, they had an EAD module um, that has to do with appraisers. The lenders that are on the line are, are familiar with this. Um, that new, um, the old model is still available, but this it's going to transition to this um, new uh, module on Catalyst. Uh, underwriting guidelines for borrowers with previous mortgage payment forbearance. So you're thinking about what happens if they were in a forbearance and now they they're ready to to buy their house. So these are the underwriting guidelines. These this is the uh, payment history we're looking for once they come out of forbearance. Um, and um, so, you know, it's an unexpected time, but we still want to see that the borrower can make their, 
their housing payment. You know, we don't want to get them into a, another bad situation. It, that doesn't serve anybody. So this is in an, in an effort to help those buyers who are ready to take that next step. Okay. Uh, so FHA Catalyst, for those of you who are not familiar with FHA Catalyst, this, um, it is a system, uh, basically a document management. It started out as a document management system, but it's, it's expanding to uh, cover all different sorts. Uh, it's part of FHA's um, technology um, modernization, but um, FHA Catalyst, the single family origination module is FHA's own AUS system. So uh, lenders interested in using this system, they'll have to um, they submit an application to be approved to, to use it. Um, and I um, have had the privilege of working on the development team for this program. Um, and like any new program, it does have its growing pains, but um, this is, this is going forward, so um, I'm very hopeful that it'll it'll make everybody's life easier. Um, but this is another one of uh, FHA's um, technology modernization efforts, and I think it's it's going to be a really great thing once we get all the kinks worked out of it. Um, so uh, we've also published some new construction requirements. This has been published in the handbook, but it. It does have a sunset date, but it's a little bit further down the road. So, um, you know, be aware of it. If you're dealing with um, any new construction, um, this may apply to you. Um, so it's just something to keep, keep in the back of your mind. Um, so uh, the single family handbook 4,000.1, for those of you who may not be familiar, with it, uh, Handbook 4000.1 is the Single Family Housing Policy Handbook. Now, I know that it, that's a mouthful, and it's, um, we usually just say 4000.1. But um, if you've ever read FHA guidelines before, you may know that we used to have different handbooks for everything. Um, uh, so, there was an initiative to combine a lot of the handbooks that we have into a single source policy document. And 4000.1 is it. It handles uh, lender approvals. It handles um, appraisal reviews, condominium approvals, or loan origination um, through, through closing. It's how to underwrite a loan. Um, how to get your loan endorsed, it uh, handles servicing, it handles nonprofits, um, it will eventually encompass um, Title I um, and the HECM portion. Uh, so it will be a single, it will be like one-stop shopping. Um, now there are still programs in develop, uh, sections under development, but if you ever wanted to know what, a, what any type of guidance for single family housing in FHA 4000.1, is your source document. Um, and we published an update on November 8, 18th, and it was a long awaited um, update. So in December, FHA will publish mortgagee letters announcing the uh, loan limits, the county loan limits for the coming calendar year. The loan limits are are based on calendar year, January 1st to the December 31st. So uh, this is just to give you an idea. The floor loan limits, uh, depending on the number of units that you have, um, 356, 362, and the high cost areas um, for one unit is 822, 375. Now, there is a caveat for Alaska, Hawaii, and the Virgin Islands. They, the limits may go to these amounts, but they are still subject to the county, uh, the calculation. It's, it's based on median sales price. So if you were to look up the, the loan limits by county for the state of Hawaii, 
it's nowhere near these amounts. They can go that high, not that they do go that high. So I just wanna um, stress that because I've seen lenders um, misunderstand that in the past and they've run into trouble by not being able to um, get their loans indoors. Now, if um, you're involved in HECM loans, there is a single national loan limit of 822-375. Um, that's regardless of county, that's just everywhere. For those of you who deal in manufactured housing, uh, this, has, this guidance had to do um, with uh, com comparable sales approaches. Um, you may not, you're probably not involved directly in the appraisal, but um, if, um, you're if you're dealing with manufactured homes certified under um, this Fannie Mae program or this particular Freddie, Freddie Mac program, um, this is guidance that, re that refers to that. And we, re we revised the, a well-known form, um, the HUD 92900A, if any of you are um, familiar with that. Uh, mandatory use, it begins uh, March 22nd, 2021. Um, if any of you are familiar with this form, it used to be a combined FHA VA form, but the new form we've broken from VA, that, um, that combined form is no longer acceptable um, uh, going forward from March 22nd. This might be something, there's been a lot of conversation on this issue, but FHA Info Bulletin 2104 that was published on January 20th um, speaks to um, DACA recipients. Um, it was a touchy subject, but um, FHA will um, are has determined that DACA recipients are eligible to apply for um, FHA insured mortgages. They have to document their eligibility by being able to, to show an employment authorization um, EAD card. Um, and they must have this card. Um, doesn't matter any other documentation they may have, they have to have this um, EAD card. Um, of course, all other FHA eligibility um, and qualifying requirements are applicable, but this is a, um, it's a big change for us. So loan servicing, um, you know, there's been an, uh, it, let's just face it, this year has been weird. Um, it's been, a, it's an, been an extremely weird year for all of us. And, um, you know, we, the eviction um, and foreclosure moratorium, we want to keep people in their homes, of course. Um, so every, a, a, a common question is what's going to happen when it expires? Well, loss mitigation kicks in. Um, FHA has a dedicated national servicing center that's in Oklahoma. Um, and, and there are a number of published loss mitigation programs that servicers must take. They have to take all those steps before they can even think of um, foreclosing on a borrower, okay? Um, so, you know, FHA is an insurance company. At the end of the day, we insure lenders against potential losses. But one of the benefits of FHA insurance is that it also affords the borrower a vast array of options if they have difficulty making their payments. So, um, you know, we have informal and formal forbearances. Um, Unemployment, HAMP is a, pop, is a um, popular uh, modification tool. Um, 
And if it comes to it, there's pre-foreclosure sale, which would be like a short sale. And then of course, deed in lieu of foreclosure. You know, these are all the steps that are, are available to the borrower before we reach the foreclosure point. So um, I know this is a default um, group and I am admittedly am not a, um, a servicing specialist, but um, Mortgagee Letter 202105, which was the extension of the most recent extension of the foreclosure and eviction moratorium, um, also included um, detailed guidance regarding um, the actions uh, required on the part of the mortgagee um, with regards to um, loss mitigation for, for the borrower. And it is a 20, 24 page mortgagee letter. So um, I'm not gonna go through every um, point here, but um, you know, basically under COVID-19, if a borrower asks for forbearance, if they have an FHA loan, the mortgagee has to give it to them, okay? Now, there are opportunities for extension, um, and there's more than one opportunity, um, but they have to make that request based on the current mortgagee letter. If they need a forbearance, they need to apply for that forbearance on or before Ju the June 30th cutoff date, okay? Um, so if your clients call you and, and, and say, I need help, you know, first thing you need to do, no matter what type of loan they have, FHA loan or conventional, you need to refer them to their loan servicer. Um, you can also refer them to um, a housing counselor. And if, if, I, I highly recommend you refer them to a HUD approved housing counselor. The services are free to the borrower. Um, and they will be able to direct them and, and and give them advice, impartial advice on what their options are. Um, but like I said, it's a 24 page mortgagee letter. So I'm not gonna go point by point. And again, I'm, I'm not necessarily a, a servicing expert. So, um, but I, I will answer whatever questions that, that I can. Um, so again, if your borrowers have an FHA loan, and they need help, this is where, this is the information they need to have. Um, it is available on the HUD.gov website if you, if you search for loan servicing. Um, but I will provide the contact information to Caroline um, so that she can disseminate it to the group, um, contact information, um, where to, um, find a lot of that information, how to get in touch with myself if you have any questions going forward. Um, also along this note, uh, just before I logged on, um, we sent out an announcement that um, loss mitigation policies um, outlined in mortgagee letter 2021-05, there is a webinar available now, it's free click on it and um, you can view the webinar and it will go through in depth um, the options available to, um, to the borrowers. So again, I, I will forward this to Caroline so that she can get the information. So you have it that you can disseminate it to your clients if they need the help um, on, for anything like this. Um, so again, these are some helpful links. I will get this all to Caroline. Um, if, if you need to um, look up any of this and this last one where it says subscribe to FHA info, uh, I highly recommend subscribing to this. Um, this is where we got all the notifications of the mortgagee letters that were published this morning and um, where that webinar for the um, loss mitigation uh, link is published. Uh, we get the notification. I apologize. 
I'm probably the last person in America with, with a landline, but that was the second ring. So that was all. Um, but the FHA info link, subscribing to those um, emails. Let me tell you, I have it subscribed to my HUD email and I have it subscribed to my personal email. And I get the personal email <laughs> before I get the one to my HUD email address. And a, a friend of mine used to joke, she, she would text me the night before a, a policy was announced saying, I already got the email tonight. So <laughs> it is a great source of information. It, it contains policy updates, clarifications, training events. Um, it, it's a great it's a great information source for you. Um, and I highly recommend that you subscribe if you haven't already done so. Um, uh, this is also a graph on how to um, get your questions answered. Basically, we have a 24 seven knowledge base FAQs that you can go in and search um, for information. You, um, right now, uh, if it's, if you can't find the answer, I highly recommend emailing to answers at hud.gov. You can still call. Um, before we were all teleworking, we had folks every day who would take, take calls um, that came through the call center. Um, but unfortunately, we're not in the office, so we can't take calls. So um, it, they're, they're, the call center is still there. They'll take your message and they'll forward it if if they can't um, give you the response you need. But know that our response time is within 24 hours. So we're still providing great customer service as far as that that goes. You just you're just not going to talk to a live body. <laughs> um, but answers at hud.gov. You can email the question when you have it. You know, you don't have to wait till the phone line is open. You can email that question when you have it and, and you'll get a response. So um, that is the my formal um, presentation. Um, Fred, do you have any um, last remarks? I Yes, uh, hopefully you guys are able to see me and uh, hear me. Um, I wanted to again, I uh, think uh, Caroline um, for uh, hosting us today. I know that there were a couple questions that I kind of went over it, it previously in terms of, um, um, so Esther already hit on the uh, extension of the eviction and foreclosure moratorium and what that entails. But uh, I know that there was also a question on how uh, can your members become involved in HUD's efforts to assist uh, the community? And, you know, as I just want to emphasize, um, sharing questions and concerns that you're receiving uh, from the community will give us an opportunity to address those concerns and dispel any myths or misunderstandings. Um, additionally, um, identifying outreach opportunities for us to engage with uh, the community and giving us insight into the most meaningful impact um, with the time that we're given to to speak um, is something that we're we're grateful for because what we want to do is be able to customize um, what we present based on your needs. That's very important for us, and that's something that um, we want to we want to be sure to do. So um, whether it be in webinars or whether it be um, in person. Um, we're always looking for those opportunities uh, to engage and to learn more. Um, and uh, again, uh, and, and we, we, we do hope, um, you know, should you guys request it, um, to be able to participate in um, your national convention, I believe coming up in early to mid-April, Caroline might uh, correct me on that, um, in San Francisco or virtually, wh whatever is um, ultimately uh, determined. It's, we want to continue to build this relationship and we're again, so grateful um, and humbled at the opportunity that you guys have given us today. Um, great and great job Esther as well. Um, thank you again so much and uh, have a wonderful day. And I guess I'll turn things back over to Caroline. 
Carolyn? Yeah, and if Esther and Fred, you wouldn't mind just kind of sticking around for a couple minutes. Uh, we've got some great questions in the q and I've got some questions that came in earlier through the chat line, and I had people emailing us some questions before the presentation. So if you wouldn't mind sticking around. Uh, first off, a lot of people were asking if the presentation that Esther gave would be made available to us. I know the information will be, but the presentation itself. That's a little sticky. Um, we've some all of our presentations when we share them um, need to have the HUD, the headquarters stamp of approval. Um, and I didn't have enough time to get that back. Um, I'm going to contact them because they hadn't let me know yet um, and see what I can do. Um, I will definitely have the information links available, um, but I will do my best to get you a copy of the presentation. <laughs> It's a lengthy and, and approval process and headquarters, and so, but yeah. we're gonna we're trying to do everything that we can on our end uh, to expedite that so we can give that presentation to you guys. And that's a very common question. Uh, we teach uh, a HUD class for agents as well, agent training for selling HUD properties, and it's the same thing. We can't give out our presentation either because there are so many changes. I mean, just think about it. When we were setting this up one or two weeks ago, Esther, one of the questions is what's going to happen after March 31st? And we already know now everything's extended till June 30th. So right. there are so many constant changes um, we would understand. But we do have a question about, is there going to be a handbook or a link that's available specifically for the temporary guidelines in relation to COVID? Or is that in a mortgagee letter? Is that mortgagee letter 2021-5? Uh, the latest installment is 2021-05 um, and I can provide a link that in in the information package that I send you. Fantastic thank you so much and then also now I mean even a week or two ago this wasn't on the radar Texas with all of the stuff that's happened in Texas when you were talking about the uh, 203h the disaster loan will our brothers and sisters in Texas be allowed to take advantage of this disaster loan and how can they use it? Again, it ha it's applicable in a presidentially declared major disaster area. So the president, President Biden would have to make that declaration. Um, and they can that can be found on the FEMA website, any, any relevant uh, declarations. Um, so once once that declaration is made, then the properties and the individuals in that area that were living in that area, they have the opportunity to, to take advantage of that program. Um, and again, they would have to seek their, their loan from an FHA approved um, lender. Um, and, and all the lender has to do is say they're, they're following the guidance as for that program. And there is a special uh, section uh, in the handbook, in the 4000.1 handbook for 203H loans, where all the guidance is available on um, what special documentation may be required and uh, it, with respect to borrower eligibility. Um, again, there are, there are flexibilities in qualifying, um, you know, because let's face it, these people, it's not a matter of their pay stubs and bank statements being in the moving truck. They literally don't have it anymore. So um, there are all flexibilities as far as that that goes. But um, yeah, you have you have to wait for the announcement, the declaration. Okay. All right. Very good. And uh, I think a few people have asked, you know, what do you think is going to happen now with the upfront mortgage insurance and the monthly mortgage insurance premium? Do you feel that those fees might go up because there might be more claims or would they go down uh, in light of, you know, so many people needing FHA financing and assistance? Um, you know, I And this is conjecture. So you're, you know, yeah, I know you're not answering. I've been that asked that question. question more than once recently. Yeah. I literally have no idea. We get the announcement pretty much when everybody else does as far as something like that. Um, but I know it's it's a topic on everybody's mind. Um, I, and I, I don't know. I don't know. 
Awesome. And to then add, I think someone was asked. Oh, go ahead, Fred. Oh, sorry. I meant to say to add on to what Esther is saying, uh, the administration is still working on getting uh, political appointees confirmed. At this moment, um, we have uh, two um, political appointees that are on board for FHA. Um, one is the principal deputy assistant secretary for housing. Her name's Lopa Kolluri. Um, and another is named William Innes, and he currently serves as the special assistant to the FHA commissioner who has yet to be um, on board. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll definitely have a better idea of sort of the direction and decisions um, that are made by the um, leadership once once a permanent team, well, not permanent team, but once that that team is in place. And, you know, as those updates are made, we're going to work to you know, keep uh, external stakeholders updated on um, on the the most up to date leadership roster. So, um, okay. but yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. A lot of people have been asking that. <laughs> right, right. And uh, as far as you know, people who are falling behind on their payments, whether it's due to, to COVID or for another reason, for seniors specifically. Um, do you take into account their credit at all when they're applying for a reverse mortgage? You know, if they're falling behind on their current loan, could they still qualify to get a, a HECM uh, now? Yes. Um, you know, HECM borrowers, they, they need to go through a financial assessment. Um, it's not a FICO ratio loan. It's a cash flow loan. Basically, the underwriter is looking to determine um, once the bar gets, once they get into this loan, will they be able to stay sustain? Um, basically, can they turn the lights on, put food on the table, have gas in the car, and you know they want to be able to that the bar can sustain their their situation. And can it be used to, um, you know, help them out of a sticky credit situation? Yes, it could. They 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 could benefit from that um, on a HECM loan. So, you know, it's not a one size fits all and it's not a Band-Aid, but in the in the right situation, it could be a great thing. You know, I, I did it for my mom. So, and it, it really helped her out in that situation. And I believe in the HECM product. Um, so um, in the right time, in the right place for the right bar and situation, it is, a fantastic thing. Right, right. And I know you mentioned the uh, the loan limit, the maximum loan limit for a HECM is, uh, was it 822, 375? Yeah. Um, is there a maximum LTV for a HECM? Um, no. And um, basically that, it, it's a combination of things because we're looking at the rate the age of the youngest borrower or the non-borrower spouse, whichever is younger, and um, the value or the sales price of the property, whichever is less, or that maximum loan limit. So it, it's a simple calculation. It sounds complicated, but it if you're used to forward mortgages, it's a bit of a um, change in perspective. Um, so, you know, uh, every loan is different, you know, because the age of the bar, the rate, the value of their, their home. Um, so basically, the older you are, the more funds are available based on the value of your house. So sure. Yeah. sure. Okay. All right. And then we've got a kind of a specific question, but we've got one of the people on the, the webinar is in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And specifically would like to know which lenders are able to do these 203H, uh, the disaster loans. Uh, I guess FEMA has the disaster area and counties already up, and they just uh, want to know how they can help or find the lenders that can help their clients. Um, you'd have to check with FHA approved lenders to find out if that is a specific program that they want, they want to have to do. Okay. So okay. All right. So we just uh, search. It's not a separate approval list for that particular program. Got it. Got it. Okay. And uh, I'm going to try to wrap this up, but I do have a couple more questions that were emailed to me before the webinar. Um, and like, do you feel that these extensions in any way will be tied to 
uh, COVID vaccine rates. Like if a certain percentage of the population is vaccinated, will the moratoriums no longer be extended? Or, um, I mean, just like, is it tied to anything, these extensions? I know everyone's kind of playing it by ear and extending as needed, but, uh, you know, at some point, will they say, okay, we've got to stop extending these now? So, th so that is a that is a really good question. That's probably the most common question that we've been receiving. It's difficult though because um, the administration doesn't have um, Senate-approved uh, team in place yet, uh, including the FHA uh, commissioner. So it's very difficult to be able to answer that. Um, but one of the things that uh, we'll be doing, although we're in the field, we're fortunate because our uh, the aso acting associate deputy assistant secretary Julie Schaefer is actually um, a the director of the Philly Home Ownership Center, so she knows that her center has been receiving these questions, and all the other home ownership centers have as well. So what she's working on doing is, as um, the uh, political appointees um, settle in, um, she's working on trying to. Um, gain better insight in terms of what will drive the extension of the eviction and foreclosure moratorium and being being able to commu communicate that to us. It's nice. We, it's like we have an insider that's there in uh, DC that uh, understands the types of questions that we're getting. And um, so she's working at trying to, as soon as we know, um, we're going to work to communicate that because it's, it's important to understand the administration's philosophy on what drives their decisions. So we're going to work to communicate that. But at this point in time, uh, we, we have no idea just because we haven't been able to have those meetings in earnest uh, with them and engage with them and get a rationale for the types of decisions that they're going to make in the future and sort of what, uh, what their philosophy is that will drive those decisions. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I mean, we're at the top of the hour. I cannot thank you guys enough for your time and all of the information you've shared with our group. Esther, Fred, um, yes, I can guarantee you without talking to anyone at ARIA National, you guys are more than welcome to come and join us and, and share information on the national level uh, in person or virtually when we have our conventions, uh, when we have our local regional meetups. All of this information is good. Uh, we've got members that are lenders. We've got members that are real estate professionals. We've got real estate professionals that specialize in, in default. So all of this would be fantastic for us to share. Thank you so much for all the information. Um, if you have anything else that you want to share, please let us know. Otherwise, we look forward to the information that we're going to get from Esther, and we will pass this along to all of the, uh, the webinar participants and the viewers. Um, Caroline, if you have any unanswered questions that you want to send me that I can respond to, I did see one question on the chat for the uh, individual that wanted to know how they could get involved in selling HUD REOs, go to the HUD home store, um, and all the information is on the HUD home store. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, then, you know what, Carrie, if you can, um, maybe we can send out an email and if anyone has a question that was not addressed or that they didn't get a chance to ask, um, I can send a list of questions to Esther and maybe they can, Esther and Fred can split it up and, and provide the responses for us. All right, well, thank you so much. You know, we're right at two o'clock now. So uh, we're gonna end the webinar on time. Thank you for everyone who attended. Thank you again to our speakers. We, we really appreciate the information and hopefully we can do something like this again in the future. Our default task force is doing uh, webinars on a regular basis, and ARIA National also on the website has webinars with the other task force and the other committees. Um, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you again. You thank you. Bye.